Welcome to the Sports Pro Podcast. Hi everyone and welcome once again to the Sports Pro Podcast. My name is Owen Connolly. I'm the editor at large at Sports Pro. Hope you're well. Very good to be back and I am very happy to welcome back for I think the first time in 2021, Sports Pro Editorial Director Mike Long. Hi Mike. Hello Owen. This is the first first episode of the year for me, is it? I think it might be. I haven't checked that before and it probably would have been very easy to check, but you have been very busy uh, with various projects. Yeah, very, very busy start to the year, Owen, as always. Yeah, things, things flying off in all directions. We are going to be hearing a little bit later on from Daniel Kirshner, who is the co-founder and CEO of Greenfly. It's good as well to have everyone back from a little spell with Matt Rogan earlier this week uh, on the Playbook podcast. Hopefully everybody enjoyed that. He is going to be returning every fortnight with a new conversation uh, with a leader from inside or outside sport. And there will be so much useful stuff in there. Already had a listen to a couple of the early editions and they come highly recommended. Right now though, Mike, I know as we have discussed, you're busy with one thing and another, but we're going to take just a little bit of time to discuss a major feature running on the Sports Pro site this week. It is the Sports Tech Ideas to Invest in Now. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, indeed. So this is uh, part of a little mini-series we're running all this week on sportspromedia.com, um, all around uh, sports tech investment, where we are hearing from uh, investors, um, startup founders, entrepreneurs, advisors, executives from across the kind of global sports tech e- ecosystem, understanding uh who's making the moves, uh, where the sector is heading this year and beyond. Um, And yeah, as you say, uh, one of the the key features within that is um, our list of 20 ideas to invest in now, uh, where we are looking at um, early stage companies in the sports tech space, um, assessing their products and solutions and essentially saying to anyone with a bit of money to spend out there, "These these are the guys that you should be looking at now. Uh, for your investments. It's the second year we have run this um, this list. This year we've been working with, uh, we broadened it out to be working with a 13 strong advisory panel of investors and, and uh, analysts and, and executives from, from across the ecosystem, as I said. And yeah, we sought sort the views and opinions of these guys to understand, as I said, what, what are the top trends to watch? Who are the people making the moves? Um, the, just to just to go take a step back, really, in, in terms of the uh, when we conceived of this um, this feature last year and the seed of the idea, it was really intended as a kind of nod of of recognition uh, to those companies and founders who are perhaps under the radar, just looking to get a, a foothold within the, the sports tech space and the, the, the broader sports industry at large, um, but also as a way to kind of keep uh, rights holders and investors within the industry kind of aware of who's who's coming up, what's coming up, what's going to have a major impact um, in the future. So, as I said, all very early stage companies looking for funding or have completed funding rounds from everything from seed to series A and B. And yeah, I would urge anyone listening, if you, if, even if you don't have money to spend, Owen, uh, still very much worth investing your time in understanding who these, uh, you know, familiarizing yourself with these companies, these entrepreneurs and understanding what their products and solutions do and how they might have an impact on your business. Yeah, I'm definitely not sure I have the money to spend, at least on a meaningful stake in a in a startup tech company. Me neither. But there may be people listening who do, uh, and certainly there will be people listening for whom this is valuable. We don't probably have time to get into each of these companies and, and really do it justice, so I will encourage everyone to go to sportspromedia.com and have a run through the list. But what I did want to get a sense from you, Mike, is what are the broader trends that these companies companies are addressing but also taking it back to the conversations you were having with the advisory board that they were saying people needed to look out for and how much influence have the events of the last year had on that yeah it's an interesting one and there were um, several real clear standout trends that that came to light in our conversations with that with our advisory panel uh, members Um, you know as we as we all know there are um, you know, these, these, these broader trends taking place. So it's the changing nature of, of media distribution and content consumption more broadly. There's 
this convergence of, of physical and digital experiences, as we've spoken about uh, not so long ago on this here podcast. Things like areas like connected fitness, uh, virtual coaching and grassroots participation, obviously esports and gaming, automated kind of data and, and analytics and things like that, all based off video. These are all kind of broader trends um, that are really finding um, interesting use cases within within sport. And these companies are, are growing up around uh, these trends, off the back of these trends, they're helping to drive these trends. And so, yeah, it, it, some, of the, some of the companies haven't yet launched, some are just about venturing into sport, but they're coming with technological solutions that do have real obvious applications in sport. And some are also, you know, just now starting to partner with, with certain organizations. So I can talk, talk about a, a couple of them in there. Uh, there's a company called Zipin, for example, a US company uh, in the retail sector. One of their kind of mission statements is to banish checkout lines and self-scanners for good, uh, you know, really coming up in this kind of push towards uh, the adoption of kind of cashless payments and checkout free shopping. Uh, it's a company based in, in San Francisco. Um, and I think their technology has been applied in uh, a certain number of sports venues over in the US, such as Sacramento's Golden One Center. Um, and they, that is a technology that has uh, real you know, obvious implications, really, as, as fans return to, to sports stadiums, uh, the need to kind of, you know, avoid queues occurring and, you know, for, for touchless, cashless experiences within, within venues. So it's, a, it's an obvious one, really. They, um, they, they secured $12 million in, in Series A funding uh, not so long ago. I think it was towards the end of um, 2019. They're a six, six-year-old company. And so, you know, Clearly, at the, the the beginning of their journey within within the um, within the sports um, industry, another one coming up again in the kind of changing uh, media landscape um, and how um, content consumption is evolving is a company called Buzzer, um, whose founder um, Bohan was the former director of live content at Twitter. So obviously, he's a he's well versed in uh, you know how. Uh, rights holders and, and media companies, traditional media companies, can really leverage a social network like Twitter um, to to engage new audiences, to, to broaden and amplify the reach of of content as well. So he's established a company called Buzzer. Uh, they secured four million dollars in, in seed funding uh, not so long ago from a group of investors, including Sapphire Sport, who uh, who's um, one, one founding partner of Sapphire Sport, Michael uh, Spirito, was one of our advisory panel members. He was very bullish on, on the prospects for Buzzer. Um, so they're set to launch this year. It's a kind of mobile platform that, um, that is pitched at, at, at younger, younger fans, really. Um, and it's, um, it, 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 it kind of runs through a system of kind of notifications and, and micropayments around live games to bring people into the action uh, through their mobile phones and through... Uh, other apps that they may be using um, so real obvious potential there in terms of that that broader trend of you know how how things are shifting um, but yeah I think one of the one of the things that really comes to light in this this year's list is that um, connected fitness and, and virtual coaching element obviously off the back of the pandemic with so many people confined to their homes and, and working at a distance uh, you know um, staying fit um, in a safe and socially distant way uh, these kinds of um, platforms and, and services and solutions are, are, you know, are proliferating. We've seen major funding rounds for the real big, big beasts of the sector, the likes of uh, Peloton and Tonal and uh, and whatnot in, in recent months. And some of these smaller players are coming up, perhaps targeting specific sports, specific markets. But uh, yeah, there's a, a lot to uh, a, a lot of exciting products out there. Um, and a, a lot as well, not, not just geared towards the individual, but towards uh, more kind of youth sports, um, grassroots uh, clubs and things like that. So cost effective ways of, of tracking performance, you know, AI powered tools and things for, for athletes themselves and, and, and their coaches through systems of cameras and wearable devices. So it's, it's all covered in this list. And so, yeah, again, uh, lots, lots covered in that. I was going to say, I mean, I, I just stopped for a second to note that uh, Bohan, who's the founder and CEO of Buzzer, will be appearing at the Sports Pro OTT USA Virtual Summit next month. He's also spoken to Tom Bassam, I think just before Christmas. And Tom has, has talked about Buzzer on the podcast and, and some of the potential there. But I think 
outside of that, I, I, you know, and you touched on it there, something you hear a lot about is democratization, whether that's content or whether that's access to, uh, to certain specialisms, you know, in, if it's in the training space or if it's in event delivery, payments, that type of thing, leveraging the potential of things like AI that can shorten certain processes and mean that you don't need to have quite so many people. You don't have to commit so many resources in terms of the size of the company and, and what it needs to be in order to deliver some of these things or leveraging mobile technology and, and the potential that that has and the things that you can do with what are basically consumer platforms. You know, you don't have to build a whole new tech stack in order to be able to accomplish some quite powerful things. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And we, we've got a, an interview coming up later this week with a, uh, the founders of a, a company that featured last year. They were part of the inaugural class of 2020, a company called Slate, who, um, again, very much um, it, democratizing the workflow ultimately of, of putting together social content, branded social content, making sure that social content is on brand for uh, you know major sports organizations but they were talking very much so about um, how a lot of a lot of clubs a lot of rights holders out there are continuing to use uh, those consumer propositions um, that are fine they'll do the job they're great but they, what they have built is a an enterprise solution that is that is bespoke that is um, intentionally built with the with the needs of content creators. Um, that work for sports rights holders in mind. So, um, and it, it's enabling that co-creation, that collaboration across you know multiple time zones with multiple different entities who might be producing content for a specific rider, so, um, rights holder. So everything from the kind of social media manager to to influencers who may be employed you know within the arena to produce content on their mobile phones and things like that. So yeah, again, it's it's bringing these these kind of um, these use cases to life to, to show what can, what can be done with some of this this technology and the ultimately a lot of these uh, entrepreneurs who are, who are running these businesses are very much aware of the challenges that the sports industry faces they come you know they come from uh, in many cases the sports industry itself the sports media industry anyway um, and they, they they fully appreciate um, you know what 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 is required um, one another, another interesting uh, company in this year's list is a company called Hubster. They're a Danish firm currently at their seed funding stage in that grass participation um, sector. And at that point about democratization, that's exactly what uh, they are they're looking to to achieve really. But it's democratizing the uh, the ability for people within the population to access public spaces and make maximum use of sports facilities within their communities, um, no matter where they are. So they, they supply equipment uh, into little lockers that are installed at, at say, a basketball court or a, a football pitch. They're, they're called hubs. Um, and anyone who signs up to uh, to the app can can see what which hubs are available, what equipment is available. They can find out if hubs are already in use. They can connect with other people using the equipment currently in that um, from that hub and go and you know go and have a ball game with them or a kick about with them um, and they've, they've got um, distribution agreements in seven different countries I believe they're looking to go global this year but again it's 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 technology that enables the broader participation of, of within sport whether that's actively playing or consuming content I think that's a real uh, real theme of issues list sounds great and it, it would be fascinating to track the impact that these things have on the, the wider ecosystem of the sports business. I think if you want to know what the seeds are, to borrow a, a term from uh, from the world of investment, of the future growth of sport and, and the directions in which it's going to go, I think it's a really fascinating place to start. It's also part of Sports Tech Investment Week on sportspromedia.com. What else do we have to look forward to or look back on because it's actually later in the week um, that people will be listening to this. What 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 else is there to to, to dig into? Yeah, indeed. So we've got uh, interviews, as I said, uh, with the uh, co-founders of of that social content startup uh, Slate. We've got uh, a one-on-one with uh, Michael Spirito, who's the uh, founding partner, former um, 
uh, 21st century Fox executive who is spearheading Sapphire Sport. I think they they uh, they set up a fund to the tune of about 115 million dollars. Um, it's a couple of years ago now, uh, backed by the likes of Major League Baseball and City Football Group, as well as uh, a host of other major brands and organisations. I think they've got about 24 limited partners in total, including AEG, SAP, Sinclair Broadcast Group, uh, um, Adidas. So they've got a, you know, a, a number of different backers uh, that run the full kind of gamut of the, of the sports industry. Um, they've invested in Buzzer, they've invested in another um, honoree, if, you, if we can call them that, uh, Green Park Sports in this year's list. Uh, they were early backers of Overtime and Tonal. So yeah, we've got an interview with, with Michael uh, on, on the site this week. Uh, we'll also be hearing from the, the rest of the advisory panel, a dozen or so members of that uh, on Friday, talking about those broader themes and broader trends that are kind of swirling around the sports tech investment space loads to get involved with there so do you have at it sportspromedia.com as ever to find all of that stuff we are going to be hearing just after the break from daniel kirshner the co-founder and ceo of greenfly who've been doing their own interesting and innovative and disruptive things in the world of video consumption and distribution the creation of engaging content uh, they've got experience across sport entertainment and even political campaigns so daniel will have A very interesting perspective to share, uh, and you can catch that just after this. Hello, I'm Matt Rogan. I've spent my career creating and scaling businesses in sports and entertainment. And now I'm talking to smart leaders inside and outside sport to get their ideas on managing change and building towards a better future. You can listen in on the Playbook podcast a collection of candid, agenda-free conversations full of practical advice your company can work with. Get your new episodes right here on the Sports Pro feed and check out the rest of the series wherever you get your podcasts. Daniel Kirshner, President, CEO and Co-Founder of Greenfly. Welcome to the Sports Pro Podcast. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on. Daniel, we're going to talk about uh, digital video distribution and consumption and uh, you know creating engaging digital content but I just wanted to start just give everyone a, a route into the conversation just start by giving you an opportunity to introduce Greenfly I guess and, and tell a bit of the Greenfly story and how you came to be operating in this space. Yeah uh, thank you so uh, Greenfly we've been around for uh, about six years and it was originally uh, the the brainchild and, and founder founded by my first cousin Sean Green. The the name is 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 both a, a pun on his last name and a slang term from baseball. He was a professional baseball player uh, in the U.S. for uh, for 16 years, and thought a lot when he was playing about interactions that he was having uh, with the media and with uh, his team and a lot about content. And after he retired, he uh, he came up with his original idea of taking advantage of the tremendous developments and, and progress around, you know, everybody having effectively a, a mobile uh, broadcasting studio in their, in their pocket and really thinking about how to open that up through technology and in, enable lots of interactions and, and content exchange on a significant scale. So where does that take us now? What what's the Greenfly difference? What are you trying to solve? So we're really trying to solve how to move or content around uh, complex organizations and sports leagues and and teams are are certainly complex organizations. They have lots of content and lots of uh, incredible people that are positioned to make that content, whether those are fans or athletes or staff and lots of incredible people who are in a position to share that content on social media in really compelling ways, um, you know, particularly their athletes. And so the problem that we really solve is how do you uh, take, how do you first of all capture, collect, and bring in content from, from different sources? And then how do you connect it with the people in your organization that are in the strongest position to share that? So a typical flow would be uh, a, a team photographer or social media manager capturing content around a pitch or a game field, 
uh, loading that content through uh, the Greenfly mobile app into our back end. And then that content is automatically routed and distributed to different distribution points. So those could be uh, an athlete uh, stepping off a pitch, opening up his or her phone and seeing a curated list of uh, a curated uh, a collection of content from that from the match that they can share easily and quickly to social media. It could be a social media manager for a club getting access to content from the field in real time during a match it could be a sponsor. Uh, so really what we do is we enable these kinds of organizations to move content around very, very quickly, very, very easily with a lot of automated tools and share it directly from to social. And it isn't just the organization that's able to share, but it could be sponsors, broadcast partners, athletes, uh, anybody who's in a position, a position to really connect with an audience and, and uh, share that content. So effectively what, you know, the, the position that a lot of people are in in sport is that lots of people are talking about it. Lots of people are creating their own takes on it, either through video or, or photos or, or whatever that, you know, they're producing content off, off the back of it and around it, but it's all quite chaotic unless you're able to, to get a handle on it. It's chaotic. And I you think what happens is, I mean, if you think about a given, uh, you know, game or, or match, how much content is created around that event and, Obviously, there are things like the broadcast, but there's a ton of social content that could be content coming from the stands. It could be content coming from the field. It could be, you know, a beautiful, a professional, you know, super fast motion photograph, or it could be, uh, you know, a vertical video uh, captured of, you know, people reacting in the stands or at home around an event. There's a, a ton of incredible content that's created around events. And there are also a ton of distribution points. There are so many people that are in position to share that content and connect with an audience, you know, particularly the athletes, the, the club itself, the, the league that they're part of, broadcast partners, sponsored partners. Uh, so the challenge is taking all this great content and making it accessible, available, and shareable quickly and easily in real time by all these different uh, distribution points. I want to get into some of the broader points about distribution and consumption a little bit later but let's just let's just focus on the greenfly platform to begin with what are what are some of the the main touch points of it for clients and also before that what's the process of making sense of an internal network who's going to be producing stuff where you're going to be pulling stuff in from and creating something that's a little bit more manageable for for the person distributing that or the client distributing that yeah well i mean all of our partners have um staff, they have different relationships. I mean, those things all exist for the organization. And they're also already uh, creating lots of content uh, around events. And there's also a lot of demand for content. So some of the stuff that we're really facilitating at scale is already happening when an athlete sends a WhatsApp message to a team photographer saying, hey, did you get a photo of me scoring that goal? Um, so there's all sorts of, and, and, and of course, you know, it could be the, the person who holds the keys to the social media account for a club running around the field trying to capture stuff on their phone to to uh, you know to share with social and create that kind of in-stadium feel uh, informality. So there's all sorts of stuff happening right now on a manual level. Uh, the problem with it is it's, it's very time consuming and it's not very scalable. So if you take that athlete example, OK, so maybe the you know, the the big star on the team is is texting. Uh, three hours after the game to to the team photographer asking for photos and you know maybe the, the photographer sees that and gets it back a little later um, but that's very different than er, you know from every single player on a team having an automatically curated immediately accessible real-time access to content coming from a match so as soon as they you know step out of the showers after the after the match they're able to open up their phone see all those things organized share them immediately doesn't matter if they're the biggest star on the team or or somebody who you know just got their first you know minutes of playing time in, in some time, so it, it's taking a lot of very painful, time-consuming and manual interactions and really automating them at scale. And we could take that out to the next level, even when it comes from you know capturing UGC from fans, bringing that in at scale, you know creating celebration highlights and videos, like bringing in all this different content from all these different sources and connecting it, as I said, to all these different distribution points, all these different people that really desperately want quality content to share and, you know, and, and would not have access to it, but for our platform. There's an interesting way of framing this. And 
if we take an example from outside of sport, the work you do, which is that you work a lot on political campaigns where you are trying to funnel a lot of different, you know, some some focus, some ephemeral bits of messaging and, and focus on that core campaign message and, and drive it and make sure that it's all getting to the right place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what, what's kind of incredible is how similar these very different contexts are. As you mentioned, political campaigns, we work a lot with political campaigns. So we re- really powered a lot of the social sharing and advocate management, for example, uh, for the Biden campaign in the United States. And you know, when you think about a, a, a campaign like that presidential you know, campaign, this is true uh, you know, for smaller campaigns as well, it's just on a different scale. Uh, you have lots of different people that are, that are in a position to get your message out and that want to get your message out. So if you think about it from a political campaign, you know, some of those people are celebrity supporters. Some of those people are other politicians. So you have lots of big name people, but you also have local community leaders. You have people operating at all different levels around the country. So for, for a, you know, a, a campaign like that, you have thousands and thousands of advocates uh, that want to get your message out. And so what our platform enables is for the campaign to share at scale lots of different content for those different people to choose from. So you can you know, directly manage, you can take a, a high profile person and give them a particular piece of content for a post. You can also make available hundreds or even thousands of pieces of content that you know, thousands of people can swipe through and choose exactly what fits their message, you know, their, their, uh, what they wanna communicate uh, most closely. And so what you're doing is you're, you're transforming uh, a network of supporters into a network of advocates and people that are in a position to share a compelling content and connect with their friends, family, fans, I mean, depending on who they are, and really uh, help motivate those people or inform those people. And it's actually you know, shockingly similar to a, to a team, which also has supporters and fans and people that want to celebrate and cheer and send that message out. And so, uh, and, and athletes and, and staff and all these different people. So really what we do is we, we make it possible to sort of transform that network of, of supporters and, and relationships into a, a real network of advocates that can carry the message and engagement much further. So that's the theory. What, what is somebody who's using the platform? What are they, how are they interacting with it? What are they seeing? So it depends on, on who they are. Uh, what our platform really does is connect different people. So it, it, there's basically two sides to the platform. There's the backend management tools, which are used uh, by the administrators of the platform. So you think about, you know, in the, the context of a team or a league, you know, that's the staff. And they're able to upload content. They're able to send messages. Uh, and they're able to manage a network of people. That network, and they can be many different kinds of people, but that network of people, for example, athletes, uh, potentially fans, uh, other parts of the staff, they all have the Greenfly mobile app on their phones. And, you know, it's the same whether you're on an Android phone or an iPhone. And so in that mobile app, they can open up and access galleries of content that are being shared uh, with them by the organization through the back end. So those are those kinds of, you know, swipeable, think of them as kind of endless camera rolls of content that they can search and uh, and share directly to social media channels from. Uh, they can also receive requests to share specific content with specific copy. So if you're doing you know, an ad campaign or you want to really create a, a burst of activity around a particular moment, there can be a very specific request that's just a couple taps and that goes out to social channels with particular copy. They can also receive and field requests to create content. So the administrators in the back end can send out content briefs where they go in and they create templates and they specify exactly the kind of content that, that they're looking for. So let's say, you know, a team wants to do uh, an Instagram story featuring, you know, 10 second segments by five different players. They could go in and, and create requests for those 10 second segments. They could send instructions. They could send examples through the back end, through that, that web portal. And then, you know, the athletes who are in the app will get those requests on their mobile device and they'll be you know, taken through a very easy, clear and comprehensible process to create that piece of content and, and send it back through the phone. So you can both send content out and, and request content back. And then running alongside that, there are all sorts of communication tools. 
So ways to message back and forth, ways to organize and communicate. So think about it almost like a, a kind of Slack uh, system, uh, you know, the, the software uh, tool Slack. It's, it's almost like that, but really, really tuned for the easy exchange and movement of, of videos and, and photos and GIFs in, in media. And when you were when you were building this, what were some of the things that were foundational? What were some of the, the principles that you felt, okay, technically we can do this, but in order for it to, to serve the purpose that it needs to, we, we've got to stick to some of these things? Well, I think the most important thing for a platform like this is ease of use. And particularly when you think about that network of advocates, not having to train those people. So, uh, you know, certainly a lot of what we do could be accomplished by complicated and confusing enterprise tools. I mean, technically you could do some of this in Slack, for example, where you're sending video files back and forth, but if you've ever, you know, exchanged media in Slack, especially volume of media or galleries or content, um, it, you know, it's, it's very confusing, it's hard to share, you don't know where it's going, you don't know what it's doing. So that kind of ease and simplicity and really focusing on movement of content which can be the most you know, challenging and, and painful thing uh, using other tools. That's really what we focused on. And I think, you know, having a co-founder who was a professional athlete and really thought about it from that perspective, uh, you know, when we think about professional athletes, they may not have a lot of time. They may not have a lot of patience. They can't, you can't go back and forth trying to explain things because, you know, they have a lot going on and it's got to be really easy. It's got to be really accessible and it's got to be, you know, fun to use and more of a kind of consumer experience than an enterprise experience. So I think a really foundational piece for us was ease of use. Mm. And, and, and just, you know, you should be able to pick up the app. You shouldn't have to read instructions or get trained. You should be able to pick up the app, open it up, and, and immediately start, you know, navigating galleries of content, receiving and responding to requests. And, and, uh, and it should be, you should be able to do that without any kind of training. So I think that that's been an absolute foundational principle. I mean, we think about, a lot of what we're doing is is really just removing friction. We're making it possible to do things that, you know, without green flight, you know, take many, many steps are not scalable, require a lot of back and forth and explanation. And we're, and we're making it very, very easy and accessible. And uh, in that really, uh, that, that makes all the difference in the world in terms of an organization being able to, you know, effectively get its content out into the world. Since 2008, Sports Pro Magazine has set the standard for the business of sport in print, and it keeps on getting better. Every quarter, our outstanding editorial team gets under the skin of the industry, talking to the most important leaders and the most influential thinkers around to take you to the heart of what's really happening in sport and what's coming next. We look at the big ideas, the pivotal themes and the crucial numbers, with powerful storytelling, provocative opinion and insightful commentary, as well as guides to the deals, the developments, the destinations and the movers and the shakers, it's your essential industry companion. Head to the shop at sportspromedia.com to subscribe now. SportsPro, connecting and inspiring the business world of sport. Let's take a look at this through the other end of the telescope, I guess, or look at it from the other side. What are some of the ways in which consumption has changed that you the what are some of the observable ways in which consumption has changed in the where are we five six coming up seven years that that you've been operating green fly it's interesting because in so many ways the the world you know moved in in our direction uh i think the biggest way that consumption has changed i mean first of all when we, when we started out i mean obviously there was there were social media networks and there were there were videos on those networks but that was not that common or, and not sort of a, a huge percentage of the consumption. So, uh, you know, it's amazing, you know, just how much that shifted, but there's also just been a real shift in the kinds of content that people are consuming. So when we started out and we work a lot with, you know, commercial brands and media companies and things like that, when we started out, uh, people would say, well, you know, the kind of content that, that we're focused on is, you know, beautifully produced content, not a lot of it, longer form, all that's really shifted and there's been just an absolute sea change in the kind of content that people are engaging with and consuming on social media. And I think that that sea change, I mean, obviously started with the rise of, of, of video on social, but really, uh, you know, Snapchat stories and then Instagram stories and then TikTok. with each evolution, people are consuming more and more, you know, creative self, you know, created informal uh, short form content. 
uh, as opposed to you know longer produced content. And that really that real that shift has led to a surge in demand for more and different content. Um, and it's also led to a lot of excitement and engagement around the con around the kind of content that you can produce in our platform you know by sending out those templates and requests and getting people to make their own videos. And I, you know I think what's what's been firmly established at this point is that kind of content you know can engage much, much more. I mean, think about Quibi versus TikTok, right? I mean, Quibi tried to do short form, you know, produced, and and the thesis was, well, that would be consumed a lot more, and that really turned out not to be the case. Um, you know, uh, people love to sit down and and watch, you know, long form content on on Netflix. Maybe they'll even watch it on their phones. But but you know, when they're when they're on social channels, they want to engage with something that's quick, that's witty, that's more informal. Um, and that's more engaging. So I think you know TikTok is just the latest kind of evolution in that direction. But that's really a sea change in in consumption habits. Yeah, I mean, is that a divergence that we're seeing? Are we are we seeing certain kinds of content as being very much lean back and the you know replacing perhaps even though the the delivery method is different and the the where you're seeing it is different, it's replacing the kind of TV experience. And then other things are, are much more network based much more about creating loops and giving people incentives to get involved and, and contribute in their own way yeah i think that's a good way of putting it i mean i do think it's a divergence it's not like i mean it's not like people have abandoned long form narrative produced content you know certainly the production quality around sporting events uh it gets it gets more and more amazing <laughs> Uh, you, you know, and, and people definitely want that experience, but they want alongside it or when they're when they're picking up their phone, you know, they want something that's more interactive, that's quick, that's that's different. Um, and so, you know, I think that it, it, it is it's more of a divert. It's not like, oh, you know, we've abandoned one kind and we've gone to the other. It's just that people different modes of interacting. I think what's interesting, uh, you know, when you think about Greenfly and, and moving social content is uh, a big a big thing that we've seen the rise of in the past year. In particular, is is people using Greenfly to connect and support broadcast partners, because broadcast partners, it's not that they want to show a bunch of social content, uh, you know, during their broadcast, but they they want to augment and supplement their broadcast, and and drive people towards their broadcast, um, and and reach out to their audience, you know, to support their broadcast through through social content as well. And so there's an appreciation that you know it's it's not just about highlight clips or or chopping up. Uh, you know, a beautiful broadcast into different bits and pieces, but it's also having a social first content strategy that augments and supports the broadcast experience. So it's been interesting to us to watch. I mean, that's a relatively recent trend, but something we've just seen more and more of, which is I want to use Greenfly to get, you know, I already have my heavy duty tools to get, you know, my 4K or 8K, you know, broadcast, you know, uh, you know, you know, conveyed and set up and everything, but I need I need something that's quick and social that sits alongside it and that can get those kinds of social clips to my broadcast partners as well because they want to be able to deploy them in support of what they're doing. So let's let's explore that a bit further because I think that's quite interesting. How is that different or how has that moved on from what we were seeing broadcasters do maybe five or six years ago where they were introducing that kind of content but perhaps not in a not in an intrinsic way, you know, it might be someone would be uh, charged with the job of going out and, and farming some of this stuff from, from hashtags or what have you. How, how has that changed? What, what, is there a way in which there's a different character to what's happening now? Yeah, I mean, I think what, the, the trend that you're describing is, is uh, you know, broadcasters uh, and, and different parties in general uh, basically trying to channel what's happening organically on, on social, right? So... You know, we, we're, as you said, like looking at hashtags and maybe they're going to show during a, a, you know, headed to commercial or something that's going on on a social channel or something like that. And, you know, and, and certainly there's there's a place for that. But, you know, I think what, what we're seeing now is, it, you know, when it comes to the broadcast, the broadcasters, but, you know, just in general is a desire to really, you know, create social first content to be part of that conversation, to help direct it and support it. Uh, and engage in it in a way that's going to, um, you know, support the initiatives of the broadcaster or the team. So, you know, maybe what we were talking about, you know, several years ago might be, 
scraping hashtags and highlighting stuff that's going on. You know, right now, what I'm talking about is a broadcaster wanting to have access to content that that broadcaster can deploy that's different from, you know, uh, what, what's just out there. But, you know, getting content quickly and easily from the field, that's social first content that's captured for social. That's not just, a, a, you know, a, a chopped up uh, piece of broadcast and using that to deliver to an audience, whether that's on social channels, potentially in broadcast channels, you know, to kind of, you know, create more of an experience, bring them into the event uh, and, and also, uh, you know, promote the, the more traditional viewing experience. How has that been accelerated by the, the pandemic and the events of the last year? Obviously, broadcasters are having to adapt their workflows anyway, because they have fewer people involved in, in their traditional on the traditional side of their production. But what are some of the other ways that we're seeing that change? I mean, something that people have talked about too is the adjustment that people make in terms of what they're seeing on screen. They're more used to seeing, to take a, a big headline kind of news world example, people in Zoom conversations on screen, for example. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's so many parts of our business that um, have accelerated uh, as a result of the, of the current situation. I mean, so one thing you're talking about is, you know, uh, trying to do things in a more streamlined way with you know fewer staff on the ground or, or less ability to travel. So certainly when it comes to uh, coordinating and capturing content around events using our platform, I mean that's something that there's that's even more important now because you know there are fewer people, uh, they need to do more. There you, know, you can't. You, it's harder to travel. Like all those kinds of things are streamlined. Uh, you know, there's also been, you know, cost cutting, which has put other kinds of strains in terms of the ability to to really, you know, support some of these initiatives. So having, you know, streamlined, automated uh, tools to make it really easy for the people that are supporting events to exchange content and communicate, uh, you know, has been has been really, really crucial. Uh, at the same time, I mean, an, another trend, of course, is not having fans at events has created more of a need to figure out how to highlight a, a fan experience and, and, and create that level of excitement. So obviously doing things like, you know, cardboard cutouts in the stands or video screens showing fans at home at the, at the events. But, but also, you know, we, we launched a new tool uh, during this period called engage, which is a tool for uh, an appless uh, way of gathering and soliciting and gathering at home fan content that then can be brought in uh, to the green flight backend and, and uh, you know, deployed in any number of ways. So, um, you know, for the example, the Dodgers used that to great effect when they won the World Series to create um, these beautiful highlight videos of fans celebrating, you know, all over Los Angeles at home watching it, uh, you know, because they weren't able to have those images from the stands. So one trend is streamlined workflow uh, and needing a tool to really manage content capture around events. Another trend is uh, a tools for, uh, you know, gathering content from fans at home. And then the third trend that you also mentioned or alluded to is a kind of a continuation of what we're talking about, which is more and more just com- uh, more and more comfort with informal content. So, you know, now you see interviews with people on, on Zoom and, you know, people are quite comfortable with that. And I think you can, you, you know, when you think about news programming, you can get people on a Zoom chat, uh, you know, or, or Skype or whatever tools being used. And, and broadcast that in, in, in circumstances when it would not be possible to get those people in the studio. So I think we're seeing more relevant people. I also think people, you know, kind of enjoy uh, seeing people in their, in their home environments. And uh, in this, on the sports side, we, we see that as well. It, it's sort of a continuation of that trend that I was talking about earlier, uh, you know, TikTok being the sort of latest manifestation, which is that people like consuming content that's informal, that's more authentic, that's, that's raw, you know, it's, it, it's, it's different than, uh, it doesn't mean they don't want to, they don't want those, those beautiful uh, broadcast images with the, you know, fancy drone shots or all the technology that's going on as well. But, but they enjoy that alongside that informal, direct, you know, social content, content that's captured on the field, in the locker room, you know, in the, in the walkways of the stadium and all those kinds of things. And so, it's created a, a, a kind of a kind of collapse where people want to to consume that kind of content just as much. And so there's or even more sometimes. And so there's a need to, to really produce and supply both. And that and that's only accelerated during this period. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's a essential point in this is that context 
is important. And the other side of that, beyond people's ability to discern that when they're when they're watching something, is that some of it is something that had been seeded before, and some of it is, uh, you know, some of it, uh, some of these trends are going to have been originated now. From your position, how do you identify what each of those three things are? You know, how do you identify what the temporary things are? How do you say, well, this is something we saw in 2018, 19, this was happening anyway. And how do you say, well, nobody had thought of doing things quite like this before, but actually this is going to be beneficial for us to, you know, to take out of this situation? It's a very interesting question. I think very little of the shifts that we've seen are temporary. I mean, obviously there are big shifts that affect the industry, like not having fans in stadium that are temporary. But what's interesting to me, you know, we were just talking about that at-home fan content. The first time, and we built out a tool really explicitly designed for that because it was so important during the pandemic. But we actually saw the Greenfly, the app, uh, you know, we work with the NBA and teams started using the Greenfly app to capture, to, to solicit and collect fan content, uh, not during this this past uh, championship series, but the one before that, which, you know, before the pandemic is when we started, people start using that. Uh, one of the first, you know, great deployments of that was um, there was an incredible uh, shot. Damian Lillard for the Trailblazers had a half court, you know, game winning buzzer beater shot. And, uh, you know, we had designed Greenfly really for content exchange among athletes and staff and these small closed networks. And they just went ahead and like tweeted out, download Greenfly, enter this invite code and send us your, your videos, which was a totally off label use of the platform. Uh, and it resulted in an incredible video that I think was their highest performing or non highlight clip video of the entire year. You know, they even ran the audio on radio broadcast from it. It was people all over you know, Portland celebrating, you know, running out in the streets, dancing, all this incredible content. And, you know, what's great about you, you know, collecting the content via Greenfly as opposed to, you know, kind of hashtag scrapings. First of all, the trouble, you know, the, our system does rights clearance. So the team owns the content, they can deploy it and use it in different ways. But also there are all these people out there creating content that they may not be sharing to social, uh, that they may not be using, that you may never see, or they might not use the right hashtag or, or whatever it is. And when you go out and you ask for it, we've, you find that you get incredible content and it comes back and it's usable and you have the rights and all that stuff. But I think what's really interesting about that is that happened before the pandemic. So even sort of the most kind of specific thing that we've done from a technology, which is launch uh, tools that are really, you know, precisely designed to support that kind of use case. That's something we did do during the, and we really moved that up in our production queue uh, during the pandemic because we realized how important it was during this time. That was a trend that we saw beforehand. And so, uh, you know, accelerated quite a bit uh, during this period, but I don't think that's going away. I think people still want to see that kind of content after, uh, after this period is over, you know, the kind of streamlined on the field content, people want that. Certainly, sharing content with athletes, people want that. I think uh, I, I don't. I don't think any of these sort of major trends we've seen around content are 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 going to go away. I think that I think you know this the sort of truism that everybody keeps saying is you know we've kind of left ahead maybe five years in some of these trends. Uh, you know we've collapsed uh, time and accelerated some of these trends, but the trends were there beforehand, and uh, I don't think there's any reason to think that they won't be there afterwards as well yeah i guess it comes down to priorities and and resources as well and i suppose this is where there's an interesting overlap with uh with the biden campaign because the the priority would have been get boots on the ground get people in in voters faces but you can't do that because of the pandemic so instead you're thinking well how do we harness what energy is out there in in a different way no it's a very good point but but again when you think about that from the political campaign so yes i mean it was a big deal and and the biden campaign in particular did not do the kind of door to door canvassing you know that that uh that's been kind of the mainstay of political campaigns uh you know throughout uh you know a very long time they didn't do that because of the pandemic and so you know that put a lot more pressure on social communications and social sharing and stuff like that that said it's it's hard to imagine that communication and sharing content on social and sharing content with friendship groups and in WhatsApp threads and, and Facebook groups and all this kind of stuff that that's not going to be relevant. Even when we can go back to door to door canvassing, 
you know, those are still really, really important. And so, again, I think, you know, it it might have highlighted the demand. It might have increased the pressure. It might have accelerated things somewhat, but it's not like those things are, are going away. I also think it's interesting when you think about that kind of remote content capture that we that we power that works very well when people are are locked down in their homes but it also really works well around live events when people can gather so i think the kind of content that people are producing is going to change so instead of at home celebrations of the dodgers winning the world series you'd probably have sports bar celebrations and and uh in stadium celebrations and and you know the location and 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 context will obviously reflect the moment that we're in but um, but there's still a place for that kind of content, even in a world where people are, are not so isolated. Yeah, you're adding something rather than replacing something. The just to, you know, having reintroduced the Biden campaign to the conversation, I wanted to talk about before we wrap up the, the differences in how sports content behaves and how entertainment and, uh, and political content and other kinds of um, other kinds of messaging behave, because, you know, you did say earlier on that there were some quite strong qualitative similarities between those two exercises. What, in what ways is sport different and in what ways can it look at what people are doing in other, other sectors and think, and, 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 you know, and other forms of, uh, other forms of communication and other forms of engagement and think we can take something from that. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I, mean, I think what's, What's interesting, I, I think our our platform is most effective in the same context that social media is most effective, which is when there's a genuine passion and and genuine advocacy. It's very hard to fake. And I think, not to go back again to similarities, but what sports teams and political campaigns have in common and, and, certain, and certain brands and media companies and TV shows, and if you look at all the different you know, kinds of entities that we work with is that there are genuine advocates with genuine passion who care about, you know, about, about the sports team or the candidate or the TV show or the, the consumer brand. Uh, And I I think Greenfly is most effective when it makes it possible to connect an organization with those passionate, genuine and ongoing advocates and uh, and enable you know kind of and facilitate communication between them. I think where things start to break down is is when it's it's more transactional in nature, and there isn't a, a genuine connection. And you know I think when you think of kind of the first wave of influencer marketing, it was very transactional. It was basically I'm going to buy access to your audience by you know paying you to post something. And I think the the impact of that has degraded uh, considerably, and now there really needs to be a genuine connection between the influencer and the brand, or in this case, between the advocate and uh, and the organization whose content they're sharing. I think in many ways, sports is really a, a trend center in this area. I mean, sports is something where you have passion at scale. You have so many teams and leagues around the world, and you know they're obviously of differing levels of popularity and audience, but they, they all have like a core of, of passionate supporters. And they also have a built-in community of advocates in their fans, in their athletes, uh, in their staff. And so uh, in many ways, you know, I think uh, sport is really setting the pace for so much of, of uh, you know, communication and celebration uh, these days. And certainly for us, sports is when we started out and we tried to talk to other kinds of organizations, uh, we didn't get very far, but, but sports organizations got it immediately. And then over time, those other organizations you know, came around to really appreciating the need to communicate and share content in these ways. So I think in many ways, sport is really the trendsetter in this area. And I think other, or, other kinds of organizations have really taken their cue uh, from, from sport and from the notion of fandom in sport, uh, which is something that you now see extended to all different parts of our uh, of our of our society, but that kind of passionate following you can go back, you know, over a hundred years for a lot of these teams, and it's a relatively new thing when it comes to other to other kinds of uh, you know consumer products, for example, like apparel or or things like that. Yeah, and I suppose as well, 
interest drives conversations, right? If somebody is, if you're, if you're in a conversation and both of you are interested in it, then it builds and builds and builds. And if you're just being delivered something, uh, then it can peter out or it can be, as you say, transactional. And then it has a natural end point. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose to take it, to take it back to your TikTok example and the fact that because you're encouraging people to engage, it's, it's, every piece of content potentially has a more perpetual life cycle. Yeah, I think that's right. But anyway, we are speaking of conversations coming to the end of this one, unfortunately, Daniel, but um, I did want to get an idea from you before we wrap up about what some of the challenges are that, that are going to lie ahead in for Greenfly and, and, and more broadly in the, in 2021 and then coming out of the other side of this, um, of, of the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously, it seems to be a very challenging period. I think there's a lot of optimism long term, but a lot of challenges uh, near term. You know, certainly we're based in Los Angeles and, you know, the health impact here has really been uh, massive and it's something that is starting to improve, but it's, uh, you know, it was at its very worst uh, just a couple of weeks ago uh, for this whole period. So this is not something that's behind us and we're going to continue to see an impact, but I think we do see uh, you know, with the vaccines and, uh, and you know, deeper understanding of how to uh, treat and, and manage this illness, uh, we're starting to see really a, a path forward. So I think we will, you know, I think this, I think over the course of this year, the, the sports industry certainly should, should exit this period. And, you know, we should be, you know, by the end of the year, uh, back to fans and stadium in a more normal course of events. But I do think that, um, you know, there's obviously going to be some lingering impact, uh, economic impact, uh, which is something that, you know, will, will, will still be ongoing. For us, uh, you know, as I said, it's been a real period of acceleration and demand just because um, so many of the, of the, of the difficulties uh, around this period are things that we can help solve with, you know, remote collaboration tools and, uh, and this kind of organizational streamlining and, uh, and powering of, of uh, social media content distribution. So for us, it's a matter of continuing to really, uh, you know, in, in invest in our platform, uh, really build it out uh, to be all that it can be, and and looking at all the different uh, all, all the different opportunities ahead of us. Make sure that we're really focusing on the most important ones. I mean, that's always the challenge for us. There's so much coming in, uh, you know, things that we can do, industries that could use us, uh, play, directions that we could go. And we really have to make sure that we maintain our, our focus and we prioritize effectively and we really, you know, f- focus on what's what's most important. And so for us, that's really, you know, what, what we're what we're working to do uh, when it comes to, to building out the platform and supporting this industry. But we're, you know, we're, we were very proud to be able to support this industry during this difficult period. I mean, to give you one statistic, so we've been around for, for six years, the last year on our platform saw much more activity than the previous five years combined. So it was a period of, of tremendous uh, acceleration for us. We we're very excited to be able to, to support this industry, uh, the sports industry during these difficult period. And we're excited to be a, a big part of, uh, of exiting this period and, and rebuilding and learning from it, you know, learning from the trends that have accelerated, but also being able to do that in, in a, a much healthier uh, a much healthier climate. All right. Well, all the best with that, Daniel. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Really enjoyed this. You're listening to the Sports Pro Podcast. All right, then. That is it for another Sports Pro Podcast. Thanks again to Daniel Kirshner. Thank you to Michael Long. Cheers, Owen. Thanks to all of you for listening. We will be back again very soon. Bye bye. The Sports Pro Podcast is published by Sports Pro Media. The producer is Ed Dixon. 